I'm a funeral director and I love what I do. But recently I've reached a conclusion and I have a rather disruptive proposition for you as my idea worth spreading. I think you should stop outsourcing your funerals to strangers and trust yourselves to bring them back in house. This is nothing new, there is a historical precedent. We did used to capably take care of our dead. Generally, the person would die at home, the local midwife would come and lay out the body, the local joiner would be contracted to construct the coffin and uh, provide transport services, and the family would have a gathering in the home before the burial. Uh, and in Irish cultures, this was referred to as the wake, and this could be quite a raucous affair. Apparently, the reason for that was because sometimes, just sometimes, the deceased woke up. <laughs> then, during the Victorian era, there were three pivotal social and technical advances. People no longer died at home. They started to die in hospitals. And that began the trend of medicalised death. We perfected the art of embalming, and this meant that we could temporarily preserve a body. And cremation grew in popularity. It was seen as being more cleaner and more efficient. And so the funeral industry was established. With funeral parlours and funeral directors being the experts in death care. We relinquished our rights, and we lost our knowledge. And that's been the status quo for some time. And it's not until recently has the traditional funeral practice come under scrutiny for financial and for environmental reasons, and quite rightly so. In the UK and US, there is a resurgence in home and DIY funerals, and there are more woodland burial grounds being established. And the terminally ill are being enabled to die at home with the fantastic help and support of the hospice movement. And so families can now naturally transition from life care to death care at a best place to do so. New Zealand's a bit slow on the uptake. Despite our 100% pure branding, we only have a few natural burial cemeteries around the country. And we have one of the highest rates of embalming. Wellington's really lucky. We have the first natural burial cemetery that was established in New Zealand. And I fondly <coughs> describe this place as the arse end of a paddock. It's a rural scene. There's vocal bird life but it's our visual vernacular. And the shallow graves are at a depth where the uh, soil is more active. And the unembalmed body is either dressed in a shroud or housed in a natural coffin and returns to the earth more quickly. A tree is then is planted on the grave site and the early adopters who go back to maybe 2008 are now part of a thriving, regenerating native bush and you would have no idea they are there. For me, the natural burial experience is really special. It's distinctive, it's inclusive, and it's informal. And sometimes you get to wear gumboots. <laughs> we encourage the family to carry the coffin down the 100 metre gravel driveway. And as they do, Conversations start, connections are made, and by the time we're down at the gravesite, we're this one cohesive unit. And I have seen and witnessed some just delightful, intimate graveside services there. The family then lower the coffin into the grave, and then everybody's invited to get on the end of a shovel and to backfill, fill in the hole. This is closure. And a number of people who have been part of that experience have actually changed their funeral plans accordingly. When we established our company, Broadbent in May, in Wellington about four years ago, we wanted to be part of that change. 
Um, we had our eye on the burgeoning baby boomer market and they make for great clients because they've done their research, they know what they want and they have environmental concerns. We've been criticised for being change agents, quite frankly, that's a compliment. We've positioned ourselves as Wellington's funeral guide. Partly our approach is a bit different. Um, we share our knowledge and we find that once a family has been empowered with informed options, they gain confidence. And we notice a striking attitudinal change during the funeral process from, uh, we couldn't possibly, to, can we? Can we use our own vehicle? Can we use flowers from our own garden? Can we build our own coffin? Can we witness the cremation? Yeah, you can. And we find once you do, and once you're given a gentle nudge, you get really creative. Now, legally, you do not have to engage a funeral company. Our laws here are pretty relaxed. And despite the Burial and Cremation Act um, of 1964 currently being under review, it's unlikely that there are going to be any radical changes. But here, I'm going to offer a word of caution. If you are going down the DIY route, you have to get it right. So, I'm going to share with you some of our insights and top tips for arranging a funeral. Now, <laughs> the first one, and I think the most important, is to slow down. If the death was expected, there's no emergency. There's no reason to make any hasty decisions. This is your time to take stock and acknowledge the loss. A funeral is not a one-hit wonder. There is no way you are going to encapsulate someone's life in an hour. So just view the funeral as part of the process. Uh, you might consider instead um, having a uh, a book club evening in their name, or a memorial tramp, or you might have a, um, a dinner party to celebrate their birthday. You can lead this funeral service yourself. Some of the best funerals I have attended have been led by family members and close colleagues. And the sign of a really good funeral is when there's heckling from the floor. <laughs> it means that people are really relaxed and really present. Try and get some interactivity in there. Try and get some audience participation. And this stops the funeral from being this static spectator event. We remind families to include the children. And one of the recurring regrets we hear expressed by the older generation is that they were excluded from funerals when they were younger, and it is easily done. But by including the children, you are respecting and valuing their relationship to the deceased. Children are very upfront and ask very direct questions, the kind of questions you wish you could ask but have been conditioned not to. Our two young boys we worked with um, had been possibly slightly coerced into drawing some pictures for their grandfather, and the plan was to attach these to the coffin. And after a wee while, the five-year-old has got a few concerns, and then he's going, is that going to be burnt? <laughs> I'm not burning that. So we compromised and we took copies and we gave him back his precious originals. Um, children are perfectly capable. They can hand out service sheets, they can meet and greet, they can decorate the coffin. Give them something to do. One of the most frequently asked questions is, what is normal? There is no normal. 
You can decide on the order and the timing of the events. You might consider a evening funeral, and we find at evening funerals, people are much less distracted and they're not looking at their watches. Now, a trend that's coming out of Japan at the moment, which I think is really interesting, is a living funeral. So that means you can be present and you can hear all those wonderful tributes and you can say goodbye. A funeral is your opportunity to create a personal event that reflects the values and the beliefs of your family. I'm going to share with you a story uh, and I've been given permission by the family to do so. Jack was a young man who died unexpectedly and the family were devastated by his loss. And the family approached me to help them arrange the funeral and we were having a discussion about venues and nowhere resonated. And then I asked, would home be appropriate? And from then, the impossible became possible. Jack's funeral was in their garden. Wellington's weather had set fair and it was a beautiful day. The family were overwhelmed by the community support who provided food, who helped with the setup. Jack's coffin was by the tree where his placenta was buried. And after a multi-denominational uh, service led by a family friend, the family asked me if they could pass his coffin along a row of people standing opposite each other. They'd seen it on television. <laughs> I'd never done it before, but I agreed because I knew Jack was in the safest hands. They were not going to drop their son. And so, as planned, we continued and we walked down the road carrying Jack's coffin for about a kilometre and a half to the um, local beach where we had a blessing. And then we placed him in the hearse and we uh, went to the cemetery and everyone got involved and backfilled his grave. At every opportunity, Jack's farewell was hands-on and the family physically felt the weight of his loss. There were no secrets and there was no mystery. One day, we are going to stop breathing, our heart is going to stop pumping, and we will be dead. But hey, we've been doing this for generations. So, what's your funeral plan? Right, I'm going to do a poll. So, hands up those who have made their funeral directive clear. Okay, it's not very many of you. <laughs> right, well done those who have, fantastic. Those of you who haven't, you have got some homework to do. For me, it's a fuss-free natural burial at Makra Cemetery. Thank you.